We will be investigating the properties and principles of color through a personal revision of a classic example of hue, the color wheel. Using our strengthened knowledge of color theory, you will be asked to refresh this classic by creating a non-objective, geometric-based design that you can appropriately represent each pure hue, its corresponding tints and shades, and their relationships to each other through the medium of acrylic paint. Once you have your design, you will transfer the image to your painting surface. Do not draw directly on the painting surface just yet. Stitch together smaller pieces of sketchbook paper to create a larger paper for your 16 by 16. You could even use tracing paper or stitch together printer paper for this. Use tape at all the seams so it doesn't move. It won't really affect the outcome of the transfer. Here I have my design and marker for you all to see. I'm only doing a basic design as part of the demo. Yours should be much more complex. This project is going to be 16 inches squared, so to cut down your paper, simply mark off your 22 by 16 at 16 inches on the long side. Two dots measured at different places on the paper will give you a line. Cut your paper using a box cutter and a ruler while being incredibly careful. Go slowly with a fresh blade. You could also score with scissors or an X-Acto knife. Always use some sort of cutting mat. In this case, I'm using the back of my paper pad to keep my table protected. Once you're finished with that, tape it to your board and prepare to transfer the image. So take your stitched together paper and flip it over so the design is on the table. You'll then want to scribble over the back of the design with the darker pencil. I'm using a 9B, but anything darker than a 2B should work. I can't stress enough not to use mechanical pencil to darken the back. I'd rather use a common number two pencil. Uh, mechanical pencils could tear the paper and they could also just not be dark enough. If you're using thinner paper, it should be easy to see where the design is and then you can save some lead by only transferring over the lines you can see. Once the back of your paper is covered, place your design face up and attach it to your painting. Make sure to place it so that your image is where you want it before taping the paper down to your surface. Then preferably in a ballpoint pen, retrace your image. You can freehand it if you'd like, but I find it's easier to use rulers when you're using a geometric design. Before you finally finish, Make sure the image has completely transferred to your painting surface. Before we even begin painting, we should mix our colors for this project. Take your primary red and your primary yellow and mix them together to get your secondary orange. It will take some mixing to get it just right and you should refer to your color wheel frequently. Be sure to mix enough paint that you can use the mixed hue and have enough left over for your tints and shades. Since this project requires you to mix your primaries with your secondaries to get your tertiary colors, make sure you mix plenty of your secondary color. To save excess paint, you can store it in saran wrap and it'll keep for a while. Simply put your daub of paint in the center of the wrap and then twist the top. You can also use a rubber band or tie them off to keep them fresh. When you're ready to retrieve your paint, simply scrape it off the saran wrap and put it back on your palette. Now to mix your tertiaries, take your red and mix it with your bagged orange. This will make red orange. Then I mix the bagged orange with the yellow to make the tertiary yellow orange. From this resulting mix, I end up with my two primaries, yellow and red. They make orange, which mixing those with the primaries gives you two tertiaries. Now to make the tints and shades of each of the colors. Here I'm going to make a tint and a shade of my red. Take your red and put it in two different daubs. This will be for your tint and shade, respectively. Then take your white and mix it into red. As a rule of thumb, always mix white into your color, never your color into white. 
Continue mixing until it looks appropriate. You may want to go lighter in value by adding even more white. Again, always refer back to your color wheel. To mix your shade, take your red and a bit of black. A little black goes a very long way. As you can see here, it's immediately dominating the red. If you find you mixed the wrong shade or tint, not all is lost. You can always reintroduce your original hue back into the shade to bring it back where you need it. To mix all these paints, you're going to need a lot of space, so it's smart to bag the paints when you're finished mixing them. I'm going to mix the rest of the color wheel with my three primaries here. I take a little bit of primary yellow and mix it into my manganese blue. This will produce green as my secondary. Sometimes you might have to push and pull between the two primary colors to get the third color just right. So my green is showing up a little too yellow, so I'll just have to keep adding a little bit of blue. Once I'm satisfied with my green, I can now start making my tertiary blue-green. Satisfied with that mixture, I can move on to the yellow-green. And with that, I have my secondary and tertiaries mixed. Now I'm moving on to create my secondary violet by mixing blue and red. Once I feel I've adequately mixed my violet, I can move on to the tertiaries. Now to mix my blue-violet. Mixing red into the violet will give me red-violet. Make sure to mix your paint evenly to avoid streaks. I realize my colors are a little too warm to be on the cooler side of the spectrum. So I'm simply going to mix a little more blue into the resulting mixes. The red was a little overpowering, so doing this will cool down the colors just a little bit. Here you can notice that the red-violet is just a little too close to red, so I'm taking my blue to cool it down just a little bit. I may have added a little too much blue as it's starting to look like the violet. My red-violet doesn't really feel like a true tertiary, so I'm going to use a little bit of red just to warm it back up. Understanding color temperatures can help you with your mixing, as it helps you understand whether or not you need to cool something down or warm something back up. Now that I'm done mixing, I have all of my primaries, my secondaries, and my tertiaries. To revisit mixing tints and shades, I will take this yellow and mix it with a bit of white. Yellow is a little difficult because it doesn't want to behave with either black or white. Mixing the tint will take a lot of white as yellow is already very light in value. And as we covered in the last module, yellow really doesn't like to behave with certain blacks either. Here I'm mixing it with a little bit of carbon black. Notice how the black immediately takes over, resulting in a nasty greenish yellow. A way around this is to use a little bit of yellow ochre in conjunction with your yellow and black. The yellow ochre will darken the value of the yellow just enough and it works well in conjunction with the black so it doesn't become overwhelmed. One of the nice things about using yellow ochre in conjunction with the black and the yellow is it creates a nice warm, fairly saturated yellow shade that you can use in lieu of just black and yellow. Before we start painting, what you'll want to do is take your matte medium and mix it in with one of your colors to begin painting in the cells. Aim for a nice medium consistency that's neither too wet nor too dry. You can also use matte medium in masking off your areas. Begin by taping off the cell you want to paint. Once it's taped off, go ahead and use your matte medium to mask off the area. It'll give you a nice crisp finish when you're done. I'm starting with my red shade. This pigment isn't very opaque, so I'm going to need to put on several coats. You can speed up the drying time with a hair dryer, 
However, make sure your surface doesn't get too hot because the paint can remain tacky. Depending on how opaque your paint is, you may have to use several coats. Keep applying coats until you have a nice, even finish. Once you're finished, carefully remove the tape. Because of the matte medium we put down earlier, we'll end up with a very nice hard edge. Unfortunately, when I was peeling the tape off, I ended up with a bit of a snag. To fix these rips and snags, you can use a variety of methods. As a demonstration, I'm showing you kind of an extreme snag. If you encounter one of these, it's not the end of the world. Don't continue painting, as the texture of the exposed paper will affect the final painting. For something this big, I don't recommend sanding, but sanding will take care of smaller rips and tears. You can use a very light grain sandpaper. Here I'm using a 400 grain. Eventually sanding will get you the surface you want. However, this is a pretty severe tear. Once you're finished, cover the tear with matte medium. Make sure it dries before continue painting. To make sure that you don't have any rips, you can do something called priming the surface. Prime your surface by using a thin layer of matte medium over the entire surface of your painting. It'll create a thin film of plastic separating your paper from your paint. But it has the added benefit of protecting your paper from tape. I'm now safe to remove my tape without tearing. Now that I've fixed my paper and finished my shade, I'm ready to move on to the hue. Once again, we'll tape off our cell and use matte medium to prime the area around the tape. You can go outside the lines if you'd like, covering the rest of the cell. Because I'm still using red, I'm going to have to apply several coats in order to get a nice clean finish. Do this as many times as you need. Once I'm finished covering the red, I can finally remove the tape, exposing the rest of the cell. As you progress, you will have to get a little more creative while taping off your areas. Don't be surprised if your paper ends up looking like this. A good way to start this project is focus on your primaries. Once your primaries are applied, complete your secondaries and their tints and hues in the same manner as above. Next your tertiary colors and their tints and hues. Keep in mind your objective is to complete the color wheel without making too large of a leap between any hues. Even steps are what you're striving for. A good way to achieve this is by practicing mixing and applying your colors in a small scale on Bristol board or cardboard before applying it to your finished piece. I just showed you a fraction of this project. The rest is up to you. It may seem daunting at first, but all you're doing is mixing 12 colors, their shades, and their tints. In all, that's only 36 colors you have to worry about. It really shouldn't take you too long to complete this task. Once the mixing is finished and you've saved the paints, application will be a breeze. This is just a demo. A step-by-step -step guide is available on Canvas under Module 2.2. The project sheet is a PDF saved to the module section. It has student examples and step-by-step -step instructions. And remember, take your time and you'll make fewer mistakes. Focus on the colors according to the color wheel. This will help you mix a lot more easily.